Good afternoon, one and all. I am Priya Saravagis, Senior Coordinator, Public Policy and Analysis Cell, and co-anchoring with me is Nicole. We are hosting today's session on Foreign Contribution Regulations Act, conducted by the Public Policy and Analysis Cell. We cordially invite each and every one of you present here to this much sought session. The Public Policy and Analysis Cell aims to create public policy literacy and awareness among the student community by means of student-led public policy research and analysis. For more information about the sessions we conduct, follow the cell's social media handles, the links of which will be shared in the chat box. The Foreign Contribution Leg Regulations Act, or FCRA, is a law enacted by Parliament to regulate foreign contribution, especially monetary donation, provided by certain individuals or associations to NGOs and others within India. The Act in its consolidated form was originally passed in 1976 and mo majorly modified in 2010. The FCRA ensures that such contributions do not adversely affect internal security. It is applicable to all associations, groups, and NGOs which intend to receive foreign donations. It is mandatory for all such NGOs to re register themselves under the FCRA. The registered associations can receive foreign contribution for social, educational, religious, economic, and cultural purposes. Today we have with us Mr. Heyman Batra, who is a globally known lawyer, arguing counsel, and public policy expert. He is the elected vice president of Sark Law, a regional ethics body of Sark. He is a visiting faculty at the Indian School of Public Policy and mentor of Repeal Law Project at the Center for Civil Society. He had been associated with various projects of UN and ADB. He has been awarded with the prestigious Mahatma Gandhi Seva Medal by the Gan Gandhi Global Foundation for Effectively Connecting Legal Communities of the Sark Nations. He is a co-founder of an international law and policy think tank, Goman Bind HTO, having presence in India, The Hague, and Brussels. He is a well-acclaimed writer and author of seven diverse books on law and public policy. So, we cordially welcome you to lead today's session. Next, we earnestly welcome our support systems and pillars of strength, the teachers of the cell, to the session. Finally, yet importantly, we extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you present here. Before we begin, I would like to request all of you to keep your audios off during the course of the lecture. We will also be having a Q&A session towards the end, wherein the participants can post their questions in the chat box. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Heman Bratta to deliver his lecture. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you for the kind uh, introduction, Priya. Good afternoon, uh, participants. It is always a delightful pleasure to be to be addressing and interacting uh, with young students, uh, especially if if they you know belong to uh, law and public policy stream. I, I I look forward to such occasions where you know I, I get an opportunity to share my experience and knowledge, whatever little uh, I may possess. So let us uh, get on with, with, the, with the topic for today's discussion. The Foreign Contribution Regulation Amendment Act 2020 basically further amends the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act 2010, the principal act which is commonly known as FCRA. It is important for all of us to first understand and appreciate and comprehend the backdrop of the FCRA regime. It is not that, that this you know, FCRA scheme or regime came into being first time in 2010, as is the misconception. Uh, or perception amongst many of us. The Foreign Contribution Regulation Act came into being first time in 1976 to, to largely gauge and safeguard the societal, community, political, economic, and religious domains from the foreign interests and their impact and interference. That was the whole objective. The original act 1976 quite liberally permitted 
the NGOs and not-for-profit organizations to, to accept foreign donations. They had pre predominantly, you know, only two sets of obligations and compliances to fulfill in, in, in those days. Predominantly, you know, diligently filing annual financial statements with the government with regard to the amount which they had collected from the foreign source and spendings thereof. This law was tweaked slightly in 1984 with a view to make it a little more stringent or little stringent because I don't think it was stringent in the past. The registration of these organizations engaged in non-profit activities was made compulsory in 1984 so as to be eligible for receiving any foreign funding. The registration was made compulsory. Then came the year 2010, which turned out to be historically significant in respect of the regime of FCRA. The 1976 Act was repealed and substituted, or if I may say so, swapped by a formally stringent, stricter and harsher law, which got to be known as Foreign Contribution Regulation Act 2010, the FCRA. And it was followed by a set of rules, which got to be known as Foreign Contribution Regulation Rules uh, 2011, 2011. This was not all. As time and again, we saw several notifications, orders, press notes being issued by the government of India under these new laws. FCRA 2010 was predominantly a step toward, uh, towards making a uh, this law dealing with receiving foreign donations more forbidding, regulatory, prohibitory, and if I may say so, tactical and purposeful. The registration under FCRA was, was not to be perpetual as it was in the past. It was based, it was term based, that is registration being valid only for five years and renewable thereafter. Further, only 50% of the foreign contributions could be applied and used for administrative expenses post-2010. And all these restrictions were, you know, were not there, be mindful, in the FCRA in 1976 or 1984. Now, before proceeding to the substantive part of the lecture, which is the Amendment Act 2020, I would... I would like to take you through some key expressions or definitions uh, which exist under the FCRA. Because you would notice that as we go on with the lecture, my lecture, you know, I would be using the expressions person, foreign contribution and foreign source multiple times. So it is very important for you to, to uh, comprehend and understand these expressions, which I would be using on a recurring basis in my lecture. <laughs> now, before I move on to the significant amendments brought about in 2020, let us understand now these expressions. What are these expressions? As I mentioned, person, foreign contribution, and foreign source. These are three key expressions on which the entire statute rests. As per the FCRA 2010, a person can receive foreign contribution from a foreign source only if A, that person has a definite cultural, economic, educational, religious, or social program. And obviously, B, you know, it, it has FCRA registration or prior permission from the central government to receive such foreign contribution. And importantly, that person does not, should not, does not, should not fall under the list of persons categorically prohibited under Section 3 of FCRA. 2010. I, I would be 
throwing some light on section 3 as we move on company under the uh, erstwhile companies act 1956 so consequently only those non profits or non or, or non profits or beg your pardon charitable organizations or ngos falling under the definition of person running the said listed programs which i just mentioned and having obtained fcra registration or prior permission can receive foreign contribution from a foreign source the act defines foreign contribution as a donation a delivery or transfer made by by a foreign source of what what is foreign contribution a an article beyond a specific value excluding an article that has been gifted for a personal use and the value is 25000 by the way which has been given in the rules b any currency indian or foreign given by a foreign source would be treated as foreign contribution securities issued by any incorporated company mutual fund units government securities foreign securities derivatives or other similar in instruments you know given by a foreign source what is foreign source foreign source could be a foreign government it could be an international agency but mind it it would not include united nations and any of the specialized agencies development institutions a foreign company or a, or a corporation by whatever name called foreign source would also include an indian subsidiary mind it an indian subsidiary of a foreign company yes unless obviously you know where the foreign investment in such a subsidiary has been made in accordance with the foreign investment regulations and obviously a, a registered foreign trust or a or a foundation that will also be treated as uh, a foreign source even a foreign society or a club or a, or an association you know by again by whatever name called will be treated as a foreign source and yes how can i forget a foreign citizen any foreign citizen would also be treated as a foreign source now moving on to the substantive part of the lecture the foreign contribution regulation amendment act 2020 it was notified in september i think to be precise on 29 september 2020 to to basically amend the fcra 2010 now if you were to go through the statement of objects of the new law i am sure some of you would have already done that it is claimed by the government or by the law framers that the object of the act is to strengthen compliance enhance transparency and accountability in 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 the receipt and utilization of foreign contributions and facilitating mind it and facilitating genuine non governmental organizations or associations who are working for the welfare of the society that's the object of the amendment now as per the third party sources you know which i have researched on the yearly inflow of foreign contribution has nearly doubled in the last one decade however it seems that the foreign contribution thus received did not meet the rightful and uh, and the objective for which the utilization was to happen for which it, the, the funding was collected there was some mismatch this became a matter of concern for the government and it is claimed that the government that that the that there have been instances you know where the foreign contribution being used has been used 
by some of the NGOs and not for profits for funding protests and demonstrations thereby adversely affecting and harming the internal security and law and order of the nation yes that's the perception perhaps it is based on some intelligence uh, inform in intelligentsia and intelligence information and we have noticed several media reports that the government was able to identify quite a few organizations who omitted to adhere to the statutory compliances like maintenance of proper accounts and submission of returns consequently their registrations were revoked well that's a controversial part of the lecture perhaps we'll touch upon it at the end let us discuss the key amendments brought about by the amendment 2020 firstly if you are making notes you can make notes brief notes firstly section 3 of the act 2010 has been enlarged by the amendment act the section deals with the category of 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 persons who are prohibited to accept any foreign contribution from the foreign source which i was earlier discussing now section 3 basically includes in the list of prohibited people election candidates editor or publisher of a newspaper judges government servants members of any legislature and political parties among others the new law adds public servants as defined under the indian penal code to this list government servant was already there in section 3 but now they have added public servant as defined in the indian penal code it's a wider definition apparently the reason for inclusion of public servant is to prevent those discharging public duty from being influenced through foreign funding and avoid any conflict of interest a section of legal experts feel that you know this amendment would prevent and impede uh you know these philanthropic and and selfless individuals who fall within the definition of public servant from organizing finances activities that are intended for public welfare that's a school of thought and and the public servant definition you know it's quite wide i mean if you were to go through the definition i mean it, it i mean it's wide to include any person who is in service or pay of the government or remunerated by the government for the per, for the performance of any public duty so i mean even contractual people and people receiving any fee or commission etc would also be included now in that definition now this brings in a wider range of individuals i would say you know government and psu employees officers in the military navy or air force police judges officers of the courts of justice arbitrators and any local authority established by a central or state act you know the people who are on their roles i mean they would also be now forbidden uh, or prohibited from receiving any foreign funding for that matter secondly the amendment act substitutes section 7 of the act 2010 thereby prohibiting persons authorized to receive foreign contributions under the act from transferring such foreign contributions to any other person yes this is again a very significant amendment now before the amendment foreign contribution could be transferred to another person who is also registered to accept foreign contribution or even to the unregistered uh, uh, persons who had obtained prior permission under the act to obtain foreign contributions so you could transfer the foreign contribution received by you to another entity who was also registered entity so you could actually act as a fund seeker and transfer fund to the executor evidently this amendment has been brought about to curb ngos from working as campaigners or fundraisers and feeding the other third parties or even related associated ngos for some reason 
Now, this amendment will, I think, definitely prevent NGOs and not-for-profit organizations to collaborate for their new projects, as it has been seen that, that there are some organizations who are good in execution of projects, but not in raising money. So that there is no room now for that kind of relationship, association or arrangement. That's over now, post the amendment. That is not all. I mean, one would also see some, I would say, current projects getting into jeopardy due to lack of funds. Uh, it will be like collateral damage situation. The, the frontline smaller organization which work directly with the communities shall bear the maximum brunt, in my opinion. Thirdly, Section 8 of the Act has been amended to substantially, very important amendment, to substantially decrease the cap or limit of using the foreign contribution for administrative expenses from 50% to 20%. That's huge revision, downward revision, from 50% to 20%. Clearly, the, 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 the amendment appears to encourage utilization of such funds towards the objective and purpose of the grant. That's the logic of the government. Again, you know, some experts, um, you know, opine that this is a desirable amendment as a number of donors and, and philanthropists do not choose to support NGOs due to their substantial and random administrative expenses, which result in shrinking of availability of funds for the actual humanitarian or social objectives. They feel there is diversion of funds by the NGOs under the pretext of administrative expenses. And what are these, uh, you know, administrative expenses? I mean, which all expenses qualify uh, for, for, as administrative expenses? I mean, uh, Rule 5 of 2011 uh, rules basically covers anything and everything under the sky as an administrative expense. Salaries, wages, travel expenses, remuneration, uh, you know, of, of the executive committee members, of the governing council members, all expenses towards hiring of personnel for management of the activities, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the salaries and wages, any kind of remuneration paid, you know, cost of travel of such personnel is covered under the uh, administrative, uh, you know, expenses. Sorry, beg your pardon. So, I mean, it was felt that maximum amount of foreign contribution, I mean, it was sought for some social objective, but was getting drained in, drained out towards the administrative expenses, which were some sometimes even unjustified. So therefore, it was felt to be a diversion. And administrative expenses even included or include as per rule five, you know, even electricity expenses, water charges, telephone charges, postal charges, repairs of the premise. You know, you can always add steroids to the invoices. You can get over invoicing then done uh, uh, through contractors and, and from the back end uh, take some, you know, uh, cash benefits. That was noticed by the enforcement authorities and perhaps tax authorities with regard to the uh, functioning of some NGOs. So, therefore, uh, the they felt that the administrative expenses should be brought down from 50% to, to 20%. Uh, and, I mean, it was also noticed that some vehicles were also bought un under the pretext of administrative expenses, which for the benefit of the executive council and governing council members of the NGOs. And very high legal and professional charges were being paid to the, to the lawyers and, and, and to the chartered accountants. And sometimes even higher rentals were paid uh, for, the, for the premises. So th there, is a, there is a lot of data available which motivated government to 
take these steps. There was a blog which I read in Times of India, uh, written by somebody who opined that that most of the research, uh, advocacy, and support organizations are the ones who also work on seeking accountability from government. Highlight the governance failures. And that blog says that this amendment makes it easy for the government to throttle civil society, which challenges and asks uncomfortable questions from the government. So that is why they have reduced the administrative expenses. I don't know how far that blog contents are true. Only time will tell. Fourthly, the 2010 Act, as it stood before the amendment, allowed the person to accept foreign contribution if, as I mentioned earlier, if it had a certificate of registration. And if not registered, it had obtained prior permission from the central government. So that was the criteria in terms of administrative prerequisite or regulatory prerequisite. But now, the 2020 amendment has included some additional conditions, mind it, for obtaining such a prior permission, registration, or renewal of registration. It has become, it has become uh, all the more tighter and stricter and stringent. The applicant is now required to mandatorily provide the Aadhaar number of all its office bearers, which was not the condition earlier all the office bearers, directors, or key functionaries as an identification document. And in case you have a foreigner on the board, then you have to furnish a copy of the passport or the overseas citizen of India card for, for, for identification. Fifthly, uh, yeah, section 17 of the Act 2010, before uh, the 2020 amendment permitted the foreign contribution recipient to receive foreign contribution in an account opened in any scheduled bank. I mean, you could receive foreign contribution in a, in a designated bank account in any scheduled bank. Section 17 of FCRA has since been amended, rather substituted, requiring the recipient of foreign contribution to receive such amount only in an account designated as FCRA account, opened only in the branch of State Bank of India at New Delhi, apparently Parliament Street. So now any NGO in the country can receive FCRA foreign contribution only in FCRA account to be opened in SBI, New Delhi. However, it, however, it does provide flexibility with regard to opening an other FCRA account for the purposes of expenditures. But first stop of the foreign contribution has to be SBI account. And from there, you can take it into your other FCRA accounts maintained for the purposes of expenditures. But government wants to keep tab now how much money is coming, though they had other sources in the past also, but now they want stringent intelligence on the, on the receipts. The purpose of the amendment emerges to be to basically consolidate in a way and, and provide uniformity to the influx and moving of foreign contribution uh, uh, you know, in, in, into India, thereby making it simpler for the government to oversee and, and you know, scrutinize the, the funds received. And as I mentioned that the, uh, the, the, the person receiving the foreign contribution is, is still has flexibility to, to open other accounts, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the purposes of expenditure of that foreign contribution. So you can take that money into your other accounts. Sixthly, the FCRA Act by way of Section 11, uh, uh, you know, provides that, that, that if a recipient of the foreign contribution is found guilty of violating any of the provisions of the Act, the, the unutilized or un unreceived foreign contribution could be utilized or received only with the prior approval of the government. So 
So there is a window, even in terms of breach, even if an NGO is in a breach, it could still get a window with the prior approval of, of, the, of the government to use the unutilized fund and, and the unreceived, unreceived fund contribution. But that window has been closed by 2020 amendment. It has introduced a proviso to that section, thereby enabling the government to also restrict usage of utilize, unutilized foreign contribution or prohibit further receipts. Yes. Seventhly, uh, the 2020 amendment has enlarged the impact of Section 13 of the FCRA 2010. Earlier, the government could suspend the registration of a person not exceeding 180 days. The, I mean, you, it, the, it, it, while the inquiry is going on, the, the uh, registration for a, for, the, for a maximum period of days. However, now uh, under the amended section uh, 13, and, uh, you know, amended post 2020, uh, you know, the registration certificate of a of, of a person could be suspended up to 360 days. This is a coercive amendment. And I'm sure any decision taken under this provision will have to be backed by some valid findings and reasoning. I mean, you cannot just suspend anybody's uh, registration. I'm sure government, if, in, if it does in any particular case, it will give some reasoning because these actions can be challenged in the court of law. Eighthly, a section 14A stands added now to FCRA 2020 by new amendment, whereby a person can be permitted to voluntarily surrender their registration certificate subject to there being no contravention of any provision of the act. So basically now they are giving you an exit gate. I mean, if you uh, want to surrender your registration, uh, you meaning the person uh, receiving the foreign contributions or who's already registered uh, as an uh, under the FCRA Act, they could surrender their license uh, or permission to the government and these and, and the, the, these assets could be managed by the government then. And these assets could include schools, colleges, hospitals, etc., created out of foreign contribution. Finally, under the 2010 Act, renewal of registration was normally procedural. You know, it was symbolic in nature and was, was granted based on usual information and data. I'm talking about the renewal post five years uh, uh, termination, you know, or term ending. Now, 2020 amendment allows the government to commence a fresh inquiry into the functioning of the applicant before renewing the registration. So your renewal application would be treated as a fresh application, effectively, yeah, subject to the same amount of scrutiny and inquiries as one would do in the case of fresh application. So the mood of the government is pretty much clear that they, they, they don't want to give any concessions now under the FCRA. Now, discussing the flip side of these amendments quickly, you know, uh, which I foresee like many others, including many of you, what, what are the flip sides, you know? I mean, I, I, I as a lawyer, you know, uh, feel that this could impinge on and affect collaborations which NGOs have between among and amongst them, you know. That's my first concern because, you know, transfer of funds will be an issue now, inter se. Further, you know, when, when you retain some third party or an outsider for some project and pay that person, would that tend amount to transfer of funds or payment of fee or remuneration or service charges. Well, that is prohibited then. That, that's a gray area, you know, because that may be treated as transfer of funds. So how would you retain third parties now for the purposes of consulting? Second, I feel that the limitation on administrative expenses to 20% may not be a very viable or feasible option where an NGO is engaged in educational sector, for instance, or consultative area. Because this will thwart and restrict their efforts of internal capacity and capability building. Because you, you need to retain people, 
you you need you you, you i mean it will be a, a challenge to attract hire and employ the appropriate talent and aim on modernization that will be a challenge now because you will be under scrutiny all the time third you know like many of you would know that independent directors were not too keen to associate with companies because of the liability angle until the government clarified under uh, company act 2013 you know and the government clarified and there were judicial verdicts as well safeguarding them from the action and omission of the board similarly the the conditions uh, of requirement upon ngos to submit aadhar card and 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 you know further embargo upon public servants would in in my understanding prevent the right kind of philanthropic experts etc to get engaged in this area i mean they'll be quite scared you know unless some comfort is given by virtue of judicial verdicts in future and and the government clarifications this may possibly leave out the development sector from much needed expertise experience talents leading to the considerable shortfall and and brain deficit uh, you know for the impact sector for the development sector and even you know local branches and project offices of international non profit organization and think tanks operating in india to dis- i mean they, they they'll get affected their activities will will get affected because they won't be able to distribute the funds locally from their uh, as the funds they are receive from the head offices i mean that, that that stands prohibited now under the new regime of fcra so i don't know how these local offices of foreign think tanks and, and and ngos would would be able to distribute funds in fact international commission of jurists icj operating from geneva since what 1952 you know engaged in defending human rights and and the rule of law worldwide and and comprising of 60 eminent judges and lawyers from all parts of the world and all legal systems you know with with unparalleled knowledge of law and uh, you know with regard to human rights and so on and so forth i mean they they have condemned the fcra 2020 yes on record i mean you can check out on on the website on on uh, on the internet you know they they have severely criticized uh, amendment act 2020 i mean according to the statement issued by them the legislation 2020 fails to comply with india's international legal obligations and constitutional provisions to respect and protect the rights to 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 freedom of association expression and freedom of assembly and that's what they claim and and the icj uh, stressed that the that the provisions of of the new law would impose arbitrary and extraordinary obstacles on the on the capacity of human rights defenders and and other civil society uh, actors to carry out their important uh, work in fact uh, according to them according to icj uh, you know fcra 2020 provides for overly broad rules and measures which would def- which would effectively restrict access to foreign funding and it, it adds onerous governmental oversight additional regulations and certification while simultaneously reducing it icj says uh, you know the, the limit of administrative expenditure that that can be allocated to to um, uh, to foreign contributions to 20% uh, from the from the previous 50% so icj has come down quite heavily and and let me also remind all the students you know you may also go through un human rights council uh, resolution 22 by 6 on, on with regard to protection of human rights uh, defenders you know i mean the, the resolution says that no law should criminalize or delegitimize activities in defense of human rights on account of the origin of funding on account of the origin of funding so basically you know if i was to sum up the lecture you know the 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 the, the trigger points of this amendment as to why did 
the government choose to bring about these drastic and news tightening uh, you know measures i i identify you know following reasons you know in brief you know i will share with you you know there has been a massive escalation of the annual inward remittances of foreign contributions from foreign sources into india in the last 10 years that's alarming believe me you know and and this i'm telling you on the basis of the research which was done by uh, my juniors uh, online and and some data which i am privy to it's quite astonishing you know in the last two decades indian entities have received more than 2 lakh crore under the fcra between 1998 to 2018 more than 2 lakh crores have been received you know that's in two decades that's that's huge amount and i mean if and if i was to draw a comparative sort of figure in 98 99 the foreign donations were about 4000 crores 1999 1999 and in 2015 16 it rose to 18000 crores can you beat it 18000 crores so any government would get alarmed and would like to have a set of formal regulations and you know union home ministry had suspended licenses of some ngos which you would have read in the newspapers and, and seen in the electronic media because the, the foreign contributions were being used for objectives other than those were stipulated in their charter there is overwhelming evidence and some private experts have opined uh, even you know in favor of these amendments as well and and it's not only that uh, that you know that the private experts are are criticizing these amendments i mean there are pros and cons to to the amendments there are two schools of thoughts you know uh, which which are operating parallel you know with regard to uh, these uh, amendments uh, and 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 it is again a matter of record that you know several ngos and not for profit organizations were, were were very casual about compliances they were not observing these statutory compliances at all you know with uh, like you know submission of annual returns maintenance of proper accounts i mean they were, they were not doing uh, that at all you know they were taking everything uh, you know very casually and in today's times as young students you will realize that these factors are considered threat to the internal security of the nation you know today countries are being attacked from all directions you know whether on the border uh, through defense or or through bio weapons through chemicals through information technology and so on so forth so in conclusion i would only say that most of the times people attack a new legislation and public policy based on arguments which are driven by personal beliefs or inconveniences what is caused to them due to changes in the age old systems as we are noticing uh, what's happening with regard to farmers agitation you know if you change any age old law it is bound to be resisted and opposed so these responses sometimes become sweeping presumptuous and based more on the alleged future design of the, of the establishment alleged future designs and they have no place in the eyes of the court of law you know no place in order to challenge a particular legislation or public policy one will have to prove that the law is unconstitutional yes the law is unconstitutional for for some reason or ground uh, you cannot just make a sweeping statement that this law is bad how is it bad on merits how is it unconstitutional Uh, just because it hurts you emotionally does not mean the law is bad the new legislation may withstand the test of reasonability genuineness of its objective and even meet the tests laid down in the relevant judicial precedents predominantly by the supreme court i mean let's see you know whether this fcra 2020 amendments i mean they are able to withhold the test or not i think time will be Uh, a great test well i do not have much to add now i have already said what i uh, intended to so i would 
be happy to receive any questions if there are any, if there are any and in any case i'll even request priya to share my email id with uh, all of you i mean if to be a short of time you could always throw a question at me uh, or give me a shout on on the whatsapp yeah thank you thank sir you. it was indeed an insightful and enlightening session and uh, now, now i would like to call nicole for the question and answer session thank you priya uh, good afternoon to one and all present here i am nicole the senior coordinator of finance at the public policy and analysis cell so without any further ado let's move on with the q and a session um, we have few questions in the chat box uh, so sir tanya's question is for a csr client who can only support fcra registered non profit partners what are the implications of these amendments sorry can you come again because uh, yeah. let me just uh, let me just enhance the volume lowered it because there was some sound coming from the windows in built thing yeah now can you just repeat it so i'm yeah. so sorry no sir no problem for a csr client who can only support fcra registered non profit partners what are the implications of these amendments so, uh you're talking about the uh, uh cooperation which which can only support csr i mean i, I didn't get the question very clearly uh, uh, uh anya if you could elaborate on your question yeah 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 that would be better actually i mean if she could come on online and just explain to me what, what is she wanting to know exactly basically she is wanting to know that where the company uh, uh, has a csr funds available and that could be channelized only through fcra what would be the implication yes sir well see uh, I, i'm see when she she is talking about csr uh, i'm sure she is talking about uh, uh, foreign company because uh, in in so far as indian company is concerned that is not treated as a foreign source so i mean if uh, she is uh, talking about csr uh, of, of a company i i assume uh, that she is talking about a foreign company now uh, in in so far as uh, a foreign company is concerned it will be treated as as a foreign source and this amendment does not in any which way affect restrict uh, funding coming from a foreign company provided you know it uh, falls within the regulatory framework of the uh, fcra 2010 amended by 2020 this new amendment does not in any which way subtracts or deletes entities from the list of foreign source the company still qualify as legitimate eligible qualified funders now most of the amendments if you will see are directed towards the recipient not towards the grantor because uh, grantor uh, 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 invariably every foreign entity is covered as a grantor the 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 regulatory uh, parameters are predominantly directed towards the recipient so uh, uh, my answer to tanya's question would be that uh, it it does not in any which way narrow down the pipeline uh, the the company will only have to look for some good uh, project and recipient who stands qualified under the fcra and who holds good reputational uh, report card uh, you know generally yes so thank you sir yeah so, and and uh, and let let tanya feel free to send me an email i mean if i am unable to answer what she actually intended to ask you know so i mean she can feel free that's very kind of you sir thank you Yeah. So, sir, our next question is from Sias. What uh, with the clause on provision on transfer of foreign contributions, are there any provisions available to ensure continued operations of smaller NGOs 
who collaborate with bigger NGOs for financial as well as infrastructural resources? Well, uh, uh, I'm afraid no, uh, because this law comes into effect immediately with effect from September, uh, you know, 29th, 2020. So any funding which has gone already up to that cutoff date, that is fine. You know, that can be used by the smaller NGOs. However, post the amendment, now the transfer of funding is 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 not possible, and and uh, you know uh, so they will have to either close down their shops or they will themselves have to seek direct funding from the foreign source. So the the solution is that these bigger uh, NGOs who are basically fund seekers, you know, they could put these smaller ones in direct touch with the funders overseas and the overseas funding could then directly come to these smaller NGOs. Yeah. But definitely they're going to get seriously affected by, by this amendment of restriction on transfer of funding. Just because there is some pending project does not mean that they will stand eligible because no such exception and special treatment has been given. There is no saving clause also in the amendment to that effect. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have our next question from Akshita. So her question is, it has been said that the developmental sector of India wasn't ready for this amendment because most of, its function, most of it functions through chain effect of funds. Is there any other intervention the government could have taken which would harm this chain structure so much? Well, I personally feel that, uh, you know, what was weighing at the government's mind was that there is a lot of funding now available domestically. Uh, as Tanya had earlier mentioned with regard to CSR, though she was uh, referring to foreign companies, you know, there are CSR funds available hugely, uh, uh, you know, uh, statutorily available, which have to be spent by, by the Indian companies. So one is that the government's focus is more on the domestic sourcing of funding. Secondly, uh, government's research perhaps shows uh, that it has been acting as a two-edged blade, the foreign funding. One, that uh, foreign funding uh, has been uh, misused uh, at certain points in time for uh, quasi-political or political activities and like demonstrations and, and political, even helping some political campaigns. And second part of the blade being that even where the funds have not been used for any quasi-political politi political activities, the funds have been diverted for administrative purposes, you know, for amassing wealth, for buying some unnecessary uh, articles, uh, investing in real estate, buying some vehicles and, and you know, you, perhaps, you know, using even for the luxurious lifestyles of the governing council members and executive committee members of some NGOs. So they felt that the all funding which was received was not meeting the proper end objectives. So uh, I personally feel that, uh, you know, uh, in the given set of circumstances where the nation's security has also become vulnerable, I, I, I personally do not think there was any alternative methodology except uh, that they could have perhaps introduced some more provisions in the law with regard to encouraging the Indian set of corporates and Indian set of philanthropist uh, entities uh, to to support these smaller NGOs and other development sector based entities, they could have done that perhaps. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll now be having our last question for the day. Uh, the question is from Ritvi. She asks, as you said, the government wants to have a stringent hold upon the economy now. Do you expect to see this in the upcoming budget? Dr. Subramaniam said in an interview recently that he holds the belief that the government has an opportunity to remake the economy. What are your thoughts? 
well see uh, we have to accept that uh, you know as lawyers we uh, there is a fundamental clause which we are uh, taught uh, more so if we are into practice of corporate commercial and transaction law that is known as force majeure or act of god now in so far as uh, the uh, the economy of the global economy itself is concerned it has taken a big hit and it came uh, you know uh, absolutely unannounced as we were all hit by this uh, pandemic now uh, india has always been a resilient economy uh, i would say since 1991 you know i have seen india uh, growing um, Uh, substantially you know and and has become a major player uh, not only by sheer numbers you know uh, which we possess in terms of our population but also in terms of uh, the resilience of the natural resources and and uh, our uh, our industry industrial sector growth now in this particular budget i am not seeing i am not i am not expecting anything miraculous i am not uh, anticipating any major reform uh, because it this this time around it is going to be more of uh, empathy uh, empathy based compassion based and sub- supportive uh, budget you know because many people have got affected and uh, this support uh, supportive budget which i am expecting you know i hope to get uh, and, and it i am sure it will be supportive to the um, uh, small traders uh, retail traders to small uh, smes uh, businessmen and entrepreneurs and this will go long way in uh, giving see to to the indian economy so i definitely look forward to um, some supportive reforms not sweeping reforms but supportive reforms which i would say in next 3 to 4 years as they will unfold uh, they will take india to one of the top segments of the globe thank you sir for answering all those questions with this we come to the end of the q and a session and uh, to the participants whose on un- uh, whose questions went answered uh, you can as uh, said you can always feel free to email him and now uh, moving on to the vote of thanks we express our gratitude to mr hemant batra for this insightful session thank you so much sir thank you for taking out the time and for patiently explaining your insights to us i would like to thank the pillars of our cell our dear teachers for constantly guiding and supporting us thank you teachers and last but not the least i would like to thank each and every one of you for attending this lecture and making this event a grand success thank you all now thank you so much thank you sir and now finally i would like to request everyone to please switch on their cameras for a group photo Uh, Rino Komal is the picture taken. Um, I have taken the picture, but if few more people could turn on their cameras, that would be great. There are a few empty blocks here. Okay, it's fine. Then I've taken. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so. Okay, bye bye.